some of you have come in today with a loaded weapon. And that weapon isn't a gun. It's a tongue. Something which can be used for good purposes. Or something that can be used for very poor purposes. And that's what James shows us today in James chapter 3. The passage that Randy read. And so would you take your Bibles out and we're going to look at that passage together. Up on the screen, I've got the text, and I was going to read it, but you know, Randy did such a good job that I think uh, I'll just let you click through those slides, and, and we'll go to that next one. There we go. No, you got it. You got it. You did really good. But let's go ahead and have a word of prayer before we, we look at this further. Father God, as this passage reminds me, I've got to be so very careful as a messenger of your word. So I pray that you will really work within me so that I might be accurate, teaching it the way that it was intended to be taught, getting the author's intent out there, uh, not coming up with my own sermon, but, but relaying yours. Make me a messenger. And uh, help me so I can make it clear and, and uh, effective. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll give us all ears to hear what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, James is a master illustrator. And in this passage alone, you'll discover that he's got six different illustrations that he uses. You could divide them up into three pairs of two. If you look on the screen, you'll see that these different ones illustrate different things. He refers to a bit a rudder, a fire, a poisonous animal, a spring, and a fig tree. And the first two illustrate the careful use of the tongue. The second two illustrate the destructive use of the tongue. And the third set illustrates the inconsistent use of the tongue. So let's go back to that first one, the careful use of the tongue. And let me read this part of the passage right now. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to keep his whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal, or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. So in this first section of James chapter 3, he talks about the careful and scrupulous use of our words. And what does he do? He begins applying this to people like me people who are teachers. He says, you guys are the first in line that really need to listen to this message. And, and he says, because you are going to be handled uh, more severely in, 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 in accountability and in judgment. Uh, Jesus said it in Luke 24 where he says, to whom much is given, much is required. And when you're given that opportunity to be a teacher of God's Word, much is required. I mean, you are dealing with the two most precious commodities in the world. You're dealing with God's Word and God's people, so therefore you never want to take that lightly. And I think to some degree all of us want to be teachers. Now, many of you say, well, not me, not me. No way are you going to get me in front of a group of people. I, I'd rather be back here. But you notice in your private conversations, you sort of want to get your opinions across more than you want to listen to the opinions of others. We all have got a voice. We all want to teach others. We all want to influence others. We all want to do a majoring in output rather than input in listening. But especially when it comes to the pastors and the teachers, You've got to be so very, very careful with your words. This is a heavy responsibility. And I think there are three things that 
those of us that do teaching. It's not just pastors, it's Sunday school teachers, it's group leaders, it's Sunday school teachers, everywhere else. Uh, we need to look, first of all, at the message. We've got to be so very careful that we're not giving our message, we're giving God's message. I cannot get into this position and sh spout Ron Shevlin opinions. I sometimes do when I do them wrong. No, I'm only here as an ambassador for God. I'm a messenger. He gives me the message, I give it to you. Sure, it changes because the messenger wants to use the language of the people that he's communicating it to. He wants to use illustrations and applications and explanations so that that message is very clear. But the message needs to come from God. And it's so very tempting in the role of the teacher to throw in all of our wisdom when really it's got to be God's wisdom. Sometimes we spiritualize it. After listening to one friend preach, he came up with this one concept where, where he said, you know, God showed me something, and then he explained it. He says, so this is the way we need to act. I talked to him afterwards about it. And he says, you know, here's the problem. I don't think that, that is consistent with Scripture. And I explained why, and he says, well, I prayed about it. The Holy Spirit showed it to me. And I said, you know, we've got to be so careful in our preaching. We're communicating God's Word, sola scriptura, Scripture alone. He says, well, I can't be restricted to God's Word. I need to be listening to the voice of God. Too. That sounds so spiritual, doesn't it? But only God's Word is inspired. The Holy Spirit guides us and directs us. But it's not inspired. In everything that the Holy Spirit teaches us, we need to recognize that it's trumped by the Word of God. And the rest of God's people have got the Holy Spirit too. It should be passed by good counsel. It needs to be validated. Make sure that we are getting the message straight. And it must never be inconsistent with God's Word. It says, when we get up here, we proclaim God's Word, not our own. That's the message. Secondly is the manner. Paul said, you know, pray for me that I might speak God's Word boldly and clearly. And so when we proclaim God's word, we pray that we might speak with power. This is God's word. Thus saith the Lord. We want to proclaim it clearly so people can understand it. We want to do it compassionately, with love, recognizing God's word is something that's going to guide people in the right way. It's, so you need to have the love of the people in your heart so that what you say fits them. And sometimes it's going to be convicting, just like a parent that needs to sort of guide their children when they disobey. Sometimes it's encouraging. Yay, rah. But whatever it is, it always needs to be done out of ultimate concern for who you're dealing with. So it's got to be the right message, got to be in the right manner. And uh, third thing is, is it's got to be the right motives. That is, you've got to be so careful. You're not doing it to put yourself in the limelight, but to glorify, glorify God. Kent Hughes says it this way. Now, James is not trying to diminish the pool of teachers for the church. The church has never had too many qualified, spirit-filled teachers or leaders at any time in history. The church in the United States is dying from a lack of good teachers in its pulpit and Sunday schools, but we need teachers with right motives. Now, verse 2 shows, the mo the, uh, shows that the responsibility, be careful with the time, does not belong to teachers alone. All right? So now it expands to all of us. It notes that we all stumble in many ways, and James includes himself in that number. I sure include myself in that number. The word stumble here isn't that word that sort of indicates we fall away. It just means that, that we trip ourselves up. We stumble a little bit. None of us are perfect, and we're all going to blow it. And that's particularly true with our words. We all mess on up with our speech, and so we've got to be careful. I mean, the average person speaks 30,000 words a day. That's the equivalent of a small book every single day. If, if those words were all great wisdom, 
and you think of what a wonderful volume that would be, but of course it's not. Much of what we say is small words that accomplish nothing and sometimes negative words, which brings destruction. And so we've got to be incredibly careful. And he uses illustrations. He uses a picture of a bit in a rudder. saying, You know, you got big vessels, a big horse, a big ship, and, and yet control can be exerted just by the bit in the horse's mouth or the rudder in a big boat. And that's pretty amazing. You think of a horse. Uh, a horse can carry 550 pounds on its back. It, it, can, it can cover a quarter of a mile in, what, 25 seconds? Uh, and yet a 100-pound person can control that. I think of my wife. She weighs a little bit more than 100, but as you know, she's still a pretty tiny woman. And she loves riding horses. She's good at it. I'm not. I like riding, but I'm terrible at it. I remember one time we rented some horses and we were on a beach in Mexico and there was a, there was a drunk going down the beach. And apparently, my horse hated drunks because he's going down the road and down the beach and, and my horse intentionally decided he was going to run into this guy. <laughs> I'm trying to get the horse to go over here and said he just knocks the guy off of his feet. And I had, had to apologize. I don't think he even knew it happened, but still... My horse had some sort of prejudice against alcoholics. I don't know. But my wife, she would have controlled it. She's done a lot of writing, taken a lot of classes, and she, she's very good at controlling things like that. And a person that's a good rider has got a bit, he can control the huge animal. And that's what he calls for here. He says, you know, if you really want to show your faith, show how strong it is by controlling the got a lot of muscles in your body. That muscle is the hardest one to control. It's a control. Why do you need to control it? Because it can be very destructive. And that brings us to the destructive use of thought. And we pick it on up in verse 5, the last part. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole person, sets the whole course of his life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. The actual word there is Gehenna, and it referred to this sort of dump that was outside Jerusalem that was always burning. You're always throwing new trash, always burning. And he makes it very clear, you know, the sparks and fire that this thing starts has got a very evil, evil source. He says all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man, but no man can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. Well, it was in 1871 that Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a lantern in a barn and it started the Great Chicago Fire. And before it was done, 17,000 buildings had been destroyed. 255 lives were lost. And the very same day, there was a spark in a forest up north Wisconsin. And that thing went on for over a month and it killed far more people than happened in Chicago. I used to live in California and, and Colorado and both those places. They're always worried about the forest fires. Start so quickly and be so dangerous. So that's what can happen. We like to say, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. And that's so true in a positive way. But in a negative way, one little spark can really ignite a fire that destroys a lot of things and a lot of people. And words can be so distracting. The psalmist said this. He says uh, in Psalm 140, verse 3, that there are people who make their tongues as sharp as serpents. The poison of vipers is in their lips. Uh, Proverbs 12, 18 says, There is one who speaks rashly like the thrust of a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. So there's a lot of negative words. Now, I just need to keep Clinton awake. And so, so let's all do a little bit of talking here, okay? Uh, all join in with me a little bit. There's a lot of negative things that the tongue can do. So wherever you are, give me some examples of 
the kind of words that can be destructive for us or for others. Can you give me some examples? Criticism? Hateful speech? What? Gossip? Arrogance? Judgment? Sorry, I missed that one. Jealousy? Of course, joking? Hatred? Sarcasm? Yeah, those are a lot of illustrations. We could probably keep going, couldn't we? A lot of things that the tongue can do to be very destructive. Critical words. There are some people that, uh, that just have got the ability to be negative and be critical towards others. It damages themselves. It damages their families. It damages churches. One person's negativism can be like a domino that affects other, other people and make them pessimistic and lose hope and, and everything else. And critical words are sometimes aimed directly at people. Sometimes it's done behind their backs. Whatever the case, critical words can be, can be difficult. Sometimes they're sanctified, all right? Prettied up, used in prayer requests. But they're still used to disparage others. There's murmuring. Boy, did God get upset with those Israelites who wandered around the desert for 40 years, always murmuring, murmuring, murmuring. And uh, we can be sort of whiners too, can't we? All right? There, there's insensitive words. It's possible to say the right thing in the wrong way. And I'm afraid that I tend to do that way too often. There's contentious words. Philippians 2.14 says, Do everything without complaining or arguing. Now, I don't think I debate. I mean, I don't think I argue. I think I just debate. But my wife thinks that's debatable. Uh, but, but, you know, some of us just got that tendency to, to want to argue about everything, and it can just wear others out. There's impure words. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4 says, Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. Isn't it amazing how uh, sometimes we've got this dichotomy where we come to church and we use our ni- nice voices, our nice speech, but then we get on the Internet, yeah, and we use innuendos or in the workplace and we say things that are just totally inappropriate. And so our speech is sort of governed by who we're talking to rather than trying to keep it clean all the time. People say, do you eat with that tongue? There's a sense of purity that ought to be consistent in our life wherever we are at. Uh, there's gossip and flattery. You know what the difference is? Gossip is what you say to a person behind their back that you wouldn't say to their face. All right? And what's flattery? Flattery is saying something to their face that you'd never say behind their back. Both of them are are the kind of things that just are harmful for relationships. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up, according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. And so this passage teaches, you know, the alternative to bad speech isn't no speech. Some people say, well, I just won't say anything at all. I'm going to take the vow of silence. That sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Uh, And yet that's not the answer. You know, we use our words for positive purposes. And so, you know, it's it's amazing. Okay, here's here's a man and a woman. This woman tends to be a rather negative, critical, rigid person. Sort of goes beyond the Bible, but to the point of where she's opinionated about how things should be done. And she speaks directly to people. And uh, in, in doing some constructive criticism, so to speak. And this man does just the opposite. He feels the very same way, but he just holds it on in. Baby pulls back withdraws. Both of those things are incorrect directions where they need to go. Now we've got to be such positive encouragers using our words to build up others rather than tear them down. Well, we could go on with the list. There's offensive words. There's swearing. There's taking the Lord's name in vain. By the way, that just means lightly. All right? And so, you know, you don't have to say, you know, swear using an offensive voice using God's name in vain. 
if you just say OMG and you use it lightly like a throwaway word, or that's using it lightly. No, we need to use God's name with reverence. In his book, Taming the Tongue, Alex Uwaja says, Do you know that every word you speak has power to heal or harm? The words you choose can create either a positive or negative effect. The words you speak can uplift and inspire others to love, laugh, and achieve great things. Your words can also instill a sense of fear, hatred, and even hopelessness in the person who's on the receiving end. The words you say and think really do matter. In fact, they're far more powerful than most people realize. Imagine if you could use all the power to create a positive change in your life. Imagine if you could use words to create loving personal relationships and happy working relationships. Are you ready to harness the real power of spoken words? So what am I hoping? I'm hoping that when I go home, I'll do a better job reining in my tongue. I hope you'll do that too. Some of you that need to. But the flip side is, I hope that I'll do a better job really blessing and building up others. And so if you walk out of this building and you just sort of listen to the sermon, don't make any corrective changes, that's what James says is like looking in the mirror and not doing any difference making in your life. So, so here's my challenge. You know, say to yourself, how can I control the tongue so I don't use it for bad purposes? Do I have a swearing problem? How am I going to stop that? Do I use sexual in innuendos? How am I going to stop that? Uh, am, I, am I being critical and finding fault in others? Saying it to them or behind their backs? How am I going to stop that? Flip side, how about before you even leave? You look for a way to use your tongue to build somebody up. You encourage someone. You say, hey, can I pray for you? Uh, you, you compliment someone about what they did. Uh, you say, I love you. You do something to benefit someone. So you say, I'm not going to leave this place until I put this message into practice somehow. Wouldn't that be cool if we all did that? Wouldn't that be cool? And can you think of what positive it could do? Out with the old, in with the new, take off the old man, put on the new man, you throw away the bad practices, start a new use of your tongue. Would that not be absolutely amazing? Well, then finally he comes to the inconsistent use of the tongue. Verse 9 says, With the tongue we praise our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives or grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt water produce fresh water. We come to church and we sing God's praises. Amen. We leave the church and we... Uh, Talk about people's faults and problems. What? We use the same tongue for contrary purposes. Inconsistent. Now we need to clean that up and make sure that it isn't, it isn't right. And then you say, well, where does it come from? Well, foul language comes from a foul heart. Jesus said in Matthew 12, he says, for out of the mouth overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. But I tell you that men will have to give account on that day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. You go back to James chapter 1. It said in verse 26, If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. It's amazing how many people think that they're really spiritual and simultaneously are so destructive with their tongues. It's very sobering for me to think of how that's often been the case here. Now God wants our faith to be real, and the tongue is one of those tests that he gives, a barometer of just how strong and healthy our spiritual maturity is. Lehman Strauss says, the control of the tongue is the barometer of Christian maturity. The speech of any Christian will soon reveal whether or not he is spiritual. And so we need to realize that 
the bad use of the tongue indicates that there's something wrong down here. He says, he says, you know, you got a spring. If the spring is pure, then so will your language be. But if it's not, then you should not be surprised when out of it comes things that should not be. I am so thirsty here. Do you mind if I just take a little drink of water? Well, no, this, this is pure life water. Nestle Pure Life. It's, I guess, from a spring. Something pure. Mm. That is so good. Mm. Mm. Oh, I'm being selfish. Does anyone else want a water? Anybody want one? Uh, you're too smart to take it, aren't you? Yeah, I'm not dealing with a dumb church, no. This church is awfully bright because, you know, this water is the same water as that. But I added a little water from the restroom. Right from the toilet, put that in there. I did. Anybody want it? I'm not going to drink it. You drink it. Come on, you drink it. Come on, come on. No way. Exactly. No way. He's absolutely on target. That's what happens when we've got pollution on the inside. You say, I'm a Christian. I'm following God. Let me give you some great examples. I'm studying God's Word. I'm spending time in prayer meetings. i got all these positive things in. But you've got some corruption on the inside that pollutes that. And it comes out through the water. This polluted water, a little corruption. Messes that all up. Make sure no one drinks this afterwards, okay? Let's get that all dumped out. James, then, in the following passages, sort of says, here's how you deal with all that. And so in our next section, he talks about, you know, how to make sure that the wisdom you've got comes from above and not from below. All right? So that we make sure that, that the, the, the source is heavenly, not earthly. And then he goes on to talk about the contention that is there between us and others and other, us and God. And he says, you know, all this sort of comes from, from a self-centeredness and friendship with the world instead of with God. And so what we need to do is come to God wholeheartedly and give Him our hearts and confess our sins and enjoy His presence. And so, you know, you draw near to God, He will draw near to you. Uh, so that first one there, get the heart of your problem. Second one, submit yourself to God. Third one, Resist the devil, and what will he do? He'll flee from you. Fourth one, you draw near to God. And the fifth one is purify your hearts. So, you know, that's what it's telling us to do. And this helps us wash out our mouths with God's soap. So this is where we're going. I can't spend time this morning going there. You have to come back another Sunday. Uh, but I urge you to get your heart clean, and that way you're speech can be clean as well. God's living water can clean you up from the inside out so that you in turn can really be a blessing to others. Let's use our words to praise God. All God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let all the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. Psalm 67. May our hearts be filled with praise towards God Almighty.